Okay, so hello everybody. Today we're going to be doing our first lecture for the semester in Physics 45, and the topic is going to be basic physics review. So we're going to spend the entire first week of class on this, um, and roughly speaking what we're doing is recapping the material that you saw if you took Physics 44 or an equivalent course in high school. So the assumption here is that all this material is stuff you've seen before, so we're gonna go through it pretty quickly, um, but we do wanna to touch on all of the important things that you should know going into this course that are, of course, gonna be relevant as we build up the new material in Physics 45. So with that said, um, the chapters that are being covered here are from the textbook, uh, G and Coley, chapters one through six, so the relevant reading is gonna be found in those chapters. And also, just before we get into this uh, lecture, I do wanna give you some general advice as to how to approach these lecture videos. So the first thing is, always have a notebook by your side when you watch the lecture videos, just like you would in a face-to-face -face class, okay? So use that for taking notes uh, as you would in a face-to-face -face class. Also, your approach to taking notes, um, let me just give you a couple pointers on that. Um, so the lecture slides that I'm gonna go through in this uh, video, they're available to you on Canvas. So you don't necessarily need to copy down every single picture and every single uh, bullet point of text on the lecture slides, okay? Because you can go back to them later at any time. But I will sometimes expand uh, beyond what's on the lecture slides. So for instance, I might show you a derivation of an equation that I give you, or I might work out an example problem that I give you on a lecture slide. Things like that are when you should start taking notes, okay? So again, the, uh, the actual slides are available on Canvas, but use your notebook to take notes on things that sort of expand beyond what's on the lecture slides themselves. Okay, so I think that's everything I wanted to say, uh, so let's get into it. Okay, so before we get into any actual physics, um, I do wanna talk a little bit about uh, measurements and units of measurement. And the first topic uh, on that front is significant figures. Okay, so when we talk about significant figures or sig figs for short, we're talking about the digits in a number or in a measurement that we actually know, given how precise of a measurement we took. So this is best illustrated with an example. So let's say we're in the lab and we need to measure the length of something and we're going to measure that length and then write it down in our lab report. Now let's say I'm using a ruler to measure the length and as, as we know a ruler, um, if you're using metric units can go down to the nearest millimeter, but it's not any more precise than a millimeter. So for that reason, if I wrote in my lab report 13.5 centimeters for the measurement of the length, that's totally fine because again, it's just telling you to the nearest millimeter uh, what length I measured. But if I were to report, let's say 13.5339997, you know there's something wrong with that because there's no way I can possibly know those digits after the five because a ruler only tells you how long something is to the nearest millimeter. So that's what significant figures are all about, just rounding numbers off uh, to the right number of digits because anytime you make a measurement, there are only so many digits you can actually write down uh, because measurements are limited in how precise they can be. All right, so related to that, um, let's say you have a couple different measurements that you took and now you wanna make some sort of calculation using them. Maybe I wanna add or subtract numbers. That's the first thing let's, that I wanna talk about. So let's say we're adding or subtracting numbers. Okay, there's a rule uh, which tells us to round to the smallest number of decimal places among the numbers involved in the calculation. So here. Let's do an example. Let's say I'm uh, adding the number 1.32 plus 1.2. Well, uh, those two numbers, I can compare them. The first number 
is given to two decimal places because there are two digits after the decimal place, three and two. And the second number is to one decimal place, right? There's, there's just a two after the decimal point. So the rule tells us to round to the smallest number of decimal places, which is one decimal place. So if you just type this into your calculator, 1.32 plus 1.2, it's gonna give you 1.52, but the rule for keeping the right number of significant figures is, I'm gonna to round to one decimal place. So in other words, I'm gonna round off to where that five is, and that would round to 1.5. Okay, so that, that's how you deal with significant figures when adding or subtracting numbers. Now, there's another rule which applies when you're multiplying or dividing numbers. And that rule is when you're multiplying or dividing numbers, you're going to round the result to the smallest number of significant figures. So let's take a look at that. Let's say I'm doing 12 times uh, 3.95. Okay, so the number 12 has two significant figures and the number 3.95 has three significant figures. The rule says that I should be rounding to the smallest number of significant figures, which is two. So again, if you just sort of type this in your calculator, you will get 47.4, but I put a little bar above the seven because I know that's where I'm gonna round off. And I'd round it off to 47 in that case. Okay, so that's just a little bit about significant figures. This is going to come into play anytime you make a calculation or make a measurement. So keep these rules in mind. Okay, <clears throat> so the next thing is units of measurement. So whenever we're doing physics, we're going to be using SI units. Uh, this is a system of units that is used all around the world and it's widely used in science in general. And pretty much the United States is one of the only exceptions to using SI units. Um, here, we use things like miles instead of kilometers, and we use you know feet instead of meters. Uh, but pretty much in every other context um, around the world, SI units are gonna be what's used. So in SI units, uh, we have what are called the base units. Okay, so the base units are what we use to define all other units. So let me give you the base units real quick. Uh, when we talk about units of time, we use seconds. When we talk about units of length, we use meters. And when we talk about units of mass, we use kilograms. So when I say these are the base units, what I mean is any other type of unit you might want to use can be built up using these units. For instance, let's say I had a speed I can use meters per second, right? So I'm just using different combinations of the base units to define other units. Okay, oftentimes we're gonna need to do unit conversions. So we'll have some kind of measurement expressed in one unit and then we'll wanna write it in a different unit. So there's a way to do that, which is to use conversion factors. So a conversion factor is nothing more than a ratio that's equal to one. And the way we kind of think about these ratios is like this. Let's, let's just take a look at uh, the first example, okay? So the, the ratio you see is 12 inches divided by one foot. Now, when I say that's a ratio equal to one, what I mean is the quantity that's on top, 12 inches, is the same as the quantity that's on the bottom, one foot, right? So 12 inches and one foot are the same thing. They're just expressed in different units. So whenever you have that situation, you know, the same number on the top and bottom of a fraction, that's just equal to one, like three over three or five over five, for instance. Here's another example, 24 hours divided by one day. We know that's the same amount of time. We're just talking about it in different units. So that's a ratio equal to one. And then same with 100 centimeters over one meter. Again, it's the same amount of length. That's a ratio equal to one. So what would happen if I, you know, multiplied some number by one of these conversion factors? Well, that would be the same thing as multiplying by one. And we know that multiplying something by one doesn't change it, right? If I, if I take the number three and then I multiply by one and multiply by one and then just keep doing that, I'm still going to have three at the end of the day. So multiplying by conversion factors doesn't actually change the number that you 
are talking about, it just changes the units. So that's exactly what we want to do when we do unit conversion. Change the units, but don't change the, the measurements that we're talking about. Okay, so here's an example of using these conversion factors to uh, change units. So the example is how many seconds are in one day? Okay, well, we're gonna start with one day. That's the uh, amount of time that we want to talk about. And then we just need to multiply this by a bunch of conversion factors until it's expressed in seconds. So we can do this in a couple steps. The first is there are 24 hours in one day. That's the conversion factor from above. And notice that we can cross cancel the unit of day. And then we can do 60 minutes in every one hour. And when we introduce uh, that conversion factor, notice how we can uh, also cross cancel the units of hours. And then finally, there's 60 seconds in one minute. You can cross cancel uh, the units of minutes. And if we look at the unit we're left with, it's, it's um, seconds, right? That's the only thing that's left over. So all I need to do is take 24 times 60 times 60, and that's how many seconds are in one day. And that turns out to be 86,400 seconds, okay? So that's a pretty simple example of uh, unit conversion. This is the kind of thing you, know how, you need to know how to do um, in this class. Okay, so the first real uh, sort of physics topic then is kinematics. Let's get into this. Okay, so let's start here. Let's talk about a distinction between two terms called kinematics and dynamics. So if we're talking about the study of motion, how objects move around, we can divide that into two parts, and the first part is called kinematics. So this is the stuff you would have learned at the very beginning of Physics 44. Now kinematics is a description of motion. So how do we describe the way something moves? Well, we can talk about its position. We can talk about its velocity, which tells you how fast it's moving. Uh, we can talk about its acceleration. Okay, these are all just different ways of describing the motion of an object in a quantitative way. Okay, so if we're only dealing with that description, we're talking about kinematics. Now, dynamics deals with the causes of motion. So if we want to understand why something is moving and not just the description of how it's moving, uh, then we're talking about dynamics. So in particular, um, we learned about Newton's laws. So Newton's laws of motion are a framework that you can use to do dynamics, to understand dynamics. And, you know, without getting too deep into the details, we know that in the framework of Newton's laws, forces are the cause of motion, right? If you want to understand why something is moving, you need to understand the forces that are acting on it. So dynamics goes a little bit further than kinematics, okay? Because kinematics just describes how things are moving, and then dynamics uh, tells you or gives you some insight into why things are moving. Okay, so... Something a little bit more basic than that is how do we keep track of the motion of an object? How can we even begin to describe how something is moving? Well, you need what's called a frame of reference, okay? And a frame of reference is really just a coordinate system that you're working in to describe the motion of something. So if you look at the picture below, uh, you'll see that we have an X, Y, and a Z axis. So if we're dealing with three-dimensional space, 3D space, we can keep track of where something is as long as we have an X, Y, and a Z axis. And the X, Y, and Z axes, they're all perpendicular to each other, so they're all at right angles. And we do notice that they, they all intersect with each other. They all meet at a certain point, and that point is called the origin of our coordinate system. So in terms of X, Y, and Z coordinates, that would be the point 0, 0, 0. That's the origin of our coordinate system. Okay, <clears throat> another thing uh, that I want to review with you guys is the difference between a vector and a scalar quantity. So let's start with scalar quantities. A scalar is any sort of quantity that can be described by a number by itself. And what I mean by that is you don't need a direction 
associated with the quantity to fully describe what it is. So let me uh, give you a few examples of scalar quantities, okay? Mass, energy, an amount of money that you have in your pocket. So for all three of these examples, it makes no sense to talk about the direction associated with that quantity. So for instance, if you said, you know, I've got $100 in my pocket uh, east, or, you know, my, the mass of this basketball is two kilograms west. That, that's just a, a nonsense statement. There's no direction associated with a scalar quantity, okay? On the other hand, a vector quantity has a magnitude, so it has a certain size to it, and there's also a direction associated with it. So some examples from physics would be things like force, velocity, and acceleration. Let, let's take the example of force as an example, right? You can push something with a certain amount of force, right? And, and you know, how hard you're pushing is a statement about the magnitude of the force, but it also matters what direction you're pushing in, right? It's a different effect if I push something, you know, to the right versus to the left. So, that, so direction matters when it comes to uh, force. And really any quantity where the direction matters is a vector quantity. Okay, so lots of different vector quantities in physics. This is an important distinction. Uh, okay, so let, let's think about, um, you know, how we represent a vector on a diagram. So if you, if you take a look at the bottom uh, right on the slide, you'll see that we have a vector that I labeled A in an X, Y coordinate system. Okay, and the vector A is denoted by an arrow. So you notice that the, the arrow has a certain length to it. That's telling us something about the magnitude, right? The longer the arrow is, the, the bigger the magnitude of my vector. And then the, the arrow is also pointing somewhere, right? So the, the direction it's pointing in is telling me something about the direction, right? Okay, well, we can also uh, express a vector in terms of components, okay? So X and Y components in this case. So the component of a vector is a projection of that vector onto one of the coordinate axes. Okay, so let, let's kind of take a closer look at that. You see we have the vector A, and, and if you take the uh, tip of the arrow on the vector A and you drop it down onto the x-axis, you see the little uh, dashed line is dropped down onto the x-axis, then the length of the arrow on the x-axis is the x component. That's what I've labeled AX in the diagram. And you can do something similar with the y-axis. You can project the vector onto the y-axis, and then you can say, how long is that projection onto the y-axis? And that would be a y. So if we want to write down a vector in component form like this, we would say the vector a is ax times i hat plus a y times j hat. And if you remember, i hat and j hat just are uh, what we call unit vectors that specify the x direction and the y direction. So this is how you write down a vector in component form. Okay, next, vector addition. So if we have uh, two or even more vectors that we want to add together, there's a way to do this on a diagram to help you visualize what's going on. And it's called the tip to tail method. So, so the way this goes is you connect all the different vectors that you want to add together, tip to tail, and then you draw the resultant vector from the tail of the first vector to the tip of the last vector, okay? So this is much easier to understand if we just do an example, so let's, let's do an example. Okay, let's say this vector that's pointing kind of up and to the left is vector A. And so I wanna add this to another vector, which I'll call vector B. And let's say vector B is pointing like up and to the right a little bit, like this, okay? so. A and B right now are connected tip to tail, right? Because the, the tip of vector A is connected to the tail of vector B. So we've done the tip to tail method. Now this, uh, this last bit tells us to draw the resultant vector from the uh, tail of A, that's the first vector, to the tip of B, that's the last vector. So I know what the resultant vector looks like. 
In other words, I know that the vector a plus b is pointing up and to the right as shown on the diagram here. Okay, now we, we can also add two vectors together without having to draw a picture or anything like that. Um, if I want to know the components of the resultant vector, so like the x component of the vector I get when I add a and b, or the y component of the vector I get when I add a and b, there's a very simple rule. Just add the components of the vectors you're adding. So let's say r is my resultant vector. I want to know the x component of that vector, rx. Well, that's just ax plus bx, right? I just add all the x components of those vectors to get the resultant x component. And in a similar way, ry, that's the y component of the resultant vector. I just take ay plus by, just add all the y components of the vectors to get the resultant y component. That's how vector addition works. Okay, so the next thing we'll do is talk about some of the most important definitions when it comes to kinematics. So let's start here. Let's start with position. Now, when we talk about position in physics, you can really think about that as location. So where an object is located is the object's position, but we have to be a little bit more precise to define this mathematically. So in order to even talk about position, first we need a frame of reference. We need, again, an x, y, and a z axis that we can measure position with respect to. And then once we have that frame of reference, then we can start talking about position. So position is a vector. It has an x and a y and a z component. So the way we write this down is with the vector r. So r is what we use to uh, symbolize position. And it's x times i hat plus y times j hat plus z times k hat. That's, that's how we write down the position vector of an object. Okay, the next is displacement. Displacement is a change in position. So whenever we talk about uh, changes, uh, quantities changing over time in physics, we use the delta notation. So delta r, that's going to be read as change in position. And the way we think about that is r final minus r initial. So final position minus initial position gives you the change or the displacement. Okay, next, velocity. When we talk about the velocity of an object, we're really talking about how quickly position is changing over time. So let's uh, take a look at this first. If we take delta r, that's change in position, divided by delta t, that's a change in time, we can think about that ratio of delta r divided by delta t as being uh, a velocity. But it's really sort of an average velocity over whatever time interval delta t we're talking about. So if we want to make this velocity what's called instantaneous, so it's not you know an average velocity over some time interval, but it's the exact velocity an object has at one particular moment in time, what we do is we take the limit as delta t goes to zero, so we shrink that time interval until it's smaller and smaller and smaller until uh, it approaches zero, and what we're left with is a derivative, dr dt. So in calculus terms, that's the first derivative of position with respect to time. That's velocity. Now, acceleration is telling us how quickly velocity is changing. So in a similar way, we can set up this ratio of delta v, that's a change in velocity, divided by delta t, that's some kind of change in time. And that would be in acceleration, but averaged over some kind of time interval. But just like before, if we take the time interval delta t and we shrink it to zero, if we take the limit as delta t goes to zero, then what we get is dv dt. That's the first derivative of velocity with respect to time. But we already saw that velocity is the first derivative of position, so we can also think about acceleration as being the second derivative of position with respect to time. Okay, so if you have velocity and you take a derivative, you get acceleration. If you start with position, 
You take a derivative, you get velocity. If you take position and then you take two derivatives, you get acceleration. That's what we mean by that. Okay. So let's do an example. Um, in this example, we have an object whose position as a function of time is given by r of t shown below. Okay, so we have a cosine omega t i hat, that's the x component, plus a sine omega t j hat, that's the y component, plus b k hat. So this is all symbolic. So we have to know what we're dealing with here. So in that, uh, in that expression, we're going to treat a, b, and omega as constants. And then the only variable is going to be t, the time. So given that, uh, given that we know the position, what is the object's velocity as a function of time? What is the object's acceleration as a function of time? Let's work that out. So let's work this one out. Um, we have r as a function of t. That's position as a function of time. And it has three components. Uh, x, okay, that's a cosine omega t. Y, let's label that. That's a sine omega t. And then the z component is b. Okay, so that's how we think about this vector as having x, y, and z components. Now, if we want the velocity of this object that's being described here, we know the definition is the derivative of position with respect to time, dr dt is how we write that. But this is a vector, okay? It has x, y, and z components also. And the way we can think about those components is like this, dx dt, that's the x component of velocity. dy dt, that's the y component of velocity. And then dz dt, that's the z component of velocity. So we'll just basically calculate these three derivatives for x, y, and z to get the velocity. Okay, so let's start with x. We're taking the derivative of a cosine omega t. Well, a is a constant. Okay, so let's pull the constant out to the front before we calculate the derivative. Uh, then we have cosine. We know the derivative of the cosine function is negative sine. And then inside of that, we have omega t just like before. Now we're not done yet. We actually have to pull out a factor of omega because that's inside of the sine function. Uh, this is uh, just the chain rule. Okay, so that's uh, what we have for the first term. Then we'll, we'll move on to the second term, which is dy dt. Okay, so we'll, we'll start by pulling out the constant a, just like before. And then we have sine. Well, the derivative of sine is cosine. Then we have omega t. But then we need to pull out a factor of omega by the chain rule, uh, because again, we have omega t inside of the sine function. And that's the y component. Now the z component is super easy because b is the only thing that's there and b is a constant. So whenever we take the derivative of a constant, we get zero. So let's just write what we're doing here. We're taking the derivative of a constant and we're getting zero. Cool. So that's the velocity. Let's clean this up a little bit. We have minus a times omega sine omega t i hat plus uh, a omega cosine omega t j hat. So if, if we underline this part, we could call that vx, the x component of the velocity. If we underline this part, we could call that vy, the y component of velocity. Okay. Next thing is acceleration. I want to know how to write down the acceleration of this object. So start with the definition. It's dv dt, that is it's the derivative of velocity with respect to time. And we'll do pretty much the same thing we did before. We can take the derivative of the x velocity with respect to time. That's gonna give us the x acceleration and then we can take the derivative of the y velocity with respect to time, 
It's gonna give us the y acceleration. Okay. So, uh, it looks like um, what's gonna happen is, for the x component, I'm taking the derivative of sine, right? The derivative of sine gives me cosine. I already have this minus a times omega out front. And then also remember that I bring out a second factor of omega when I do the derivative. So this becomes omega squared. So I have minus a omega squared cosine omega t. That's the x acceleration. Okay, for the y acceleration... I'm taking the derivative of Vy. So the derivative of the cosine function is negative sine. And then remember, I already have a and omega out front. And then also remember, I bring a second factor of omega to the front when I take the derivative. So let's just call that omega squared. And we'll put the j hat unit vector because that's the y component. So here is ax and ay. Okay, so that's just a little bit of practice uh, taking derivatives to get velocity and acceleration. That's how it works. Okay, so now let's talk for a bit about kinematic equations. Okay, so if you've taken physics 44, you should know these equations very well. We've used them in a million different ways to solve all kinds of different problems. But before we sort of review what the kinematic equations are saying, let's actually talk about when we can use them, okay? Because it turns out you can only use the kinematic equations in a certain special case. So that is, if we have an object that has a constant acceleration, meaning the acceleration isn't changing over time, then we can use the kinematic equations. But if an object has a changing acceleration, we, we actually can't use these, they just don't apply. So a few things to point out about the kinematic equations. Uh, one, we have velocity v as a vector, we have position r as another vector, and we have acceleration a. So these different uh, things we defined previously are all coming into play in the kinematic equations. We also have t, which just represents how much time has elapsed. And in addition to that, some of the variables have a little subscript next to them. And that zero or the not subscript is telling you that we're dealing with an initial value. Okay, so for instance, let's look at the first equation and underline v naught or v zero. That's the initial velocity. That's what the, the little subscript is telling you. If we look on the other side where we just have v without that subscript, that's the final velocity, okay? So when we talk about the initial velocity, the reason we use the zero subscript is that's when t is equal to zero, right? That's, that's the sort of thinking behind that. Okay, so we have these three equations. I'm gonna show you how they're derived. But before we get into that, um, let me just point out that when we're dealing with kinematic equations, you can write them in vector form like you see down here. So this, this would be a kinematic equation in, oops, let me draw a better line. Okay, so this would be a kinematic equation in vector form. But you can always break a kinematic equation in vector form into components. So for example, uh, if v is equal to v naught plus at in vector form, then I have an x equation. Okay, and that x equation says vx equals v naught x plus ax times t. I also have a y equation. That y equation says vy is equal to v naught y plus ay t. And then you have a z equation as well. So you can always take a vector equation and write it into different x, y, and z equations like this. Okay, it always breaks down in that way. Okay, so let me show you uh, a derivation for those kinematic equations that we just saw uh, so you know where they come from. And I'm going to start the derivation here with the definition of acceleration. Remember, A is acceleration. It's equal to the derivative of velocity with respect to time. So when you look at this dv dt thing, 
You can think of it like a fraction where dv on top is a really small change in velocity, some infinitesimal change in velocity, and dt is some infinitesimal amount of time that passes. So if we just rearrange that fraction to say dv is equal to a times dt, that's the next step we'll take. All right, so whenever you see an equation like this, with little infinitesimal quantities on either side. So I have dv on the left side and I have dt on the right side. You should be thinking I can integrate both sides. That's, that's a valid operation that I can do. So let's do it. On the left-hand side, I'm integrating dv. And on the right-hand side, I'm integrating a, I'm integrating a times dt. Okay, now we're not done yet because whenever we have an integral, we need to specify the limits of integration, okay? So how about we, we do this on the right-hand side first, okay? So on the right-hand side, we're dealing with time. And so usually what we do is we start the clock, we, we start keeping track of time at t is equal to zero. So the bottom limit is gonna be zero. And then the top limit, you know, rather than plugging in any specific value like five seconds or four seconds, let's just put t. So, the, so the, the final time is a variable, which we'll call t. The initial time is zero. Okay, that's how I uh, do the limits. Now, on the left-hand side, I also need to put limits, and they need to actually match up with the limits that I put on the right side. So for my bottom limit, I'm going to have the velocity at time zero, that's v naught. And then for the top limit, I'm gonna have the velocity at time t, which I just call v generically, okay? So, so just to uh, reiterate what I said, v naught, that's the initial velocity. So that's at time uh, zero. And then v, that's our final velocity. And we know that corresponds to at time t, okay? So that's how the bottom and the top limits uh, match up on each side. Okay, the next thing we're gonna do is use the fact that the acceleration is constant. Okay, so the fact that we have constant acceleration is really important for how this derivation goes. Because here, I'm gonna copy down uh, the, the left-hand side as we had it before. So it's v naught to v as our limits, and then dv is what we're integrating. Now that equals the integral of a times dt. But you see a is inside of the integral, but if it's a constant, we can pull it out of the integral like this. And now we just have zero to t dt. All right, so at this point, we're ready to evaluate both sides and uh, calculate what we get. So here, let's do the left side. These are actually both really simple integrals on the left and the right side. So if we just have dv, that integrates to v. And we're evaluating that from v naught to v. That's the left side. On the right side, we have the constant a, which, I'll, which we pulled out to the front, and then we have dt, which integrates to just t. And what do we do? We evaluate from zero to t, okay? So now what we're gonna do is plug in the limits. On the, on the top limit, on the left side, I have v, and then I subtract what I get when I plug in the bottom limit, which is v naught. On the right side, I have a, plug in the top limit is t, plug in the bottom limit is zero. Okay, that's how I integrate that equation. And then if we just rearrange things, uh, if we add v naught to both sides, we're gonna get v is equal to v naught plus a t. That's our first kinematic equation. What is it telling us? If we wanna know the final velocity, that's the left side, then I just take the initial velocity Okay, that's v naught. And then I add to that 
a times t. That's basically what this says. Final velocity is initial velocity plus acceleration times time. There you go. Okay, so to derive the next equation, we're going to use the definition of velocity. So the definition of velocity is the derivative of position with respect to time. It's dr dt, like this. And just like before, we can rearrange the equation to say dr is equal to v times dt. And the next thing we can do is a substitution. So dr is on the left side. And then v, that's, think of that as the final velocity. The equation for that is something we just derived. It's v naught plus a t. So I'm just literally plugging that in for v, and then we have dt on the outside. Okay, so what do you think we're going to do next? Just like before, we have uh, an equation with infinitesimals on each side, so we can integrate both sides. So on the left, I have integral of dr, and on the right, I have integral of v naught plus a t dt. All right, let's put the limits of integration uh, on both sides. So on the right side, we're integrating over time. So just like before, we're going to go from 0 to t. Whereas on the left side, we're integrating over position, right, r. So we're going to go from r naught, that's the initial position at time 0, and then we're going to end up at r, that's our final position. Okay. So the, the left side of this integral, um, the way it works out is pretty straightforward. It's just r minus r naught. I'm, I'm skipping over some of the details here, but just think back to what we did previously, where we integrated dv from v naught to v. It works out the same exact way. It's just r minus r naught, just like over here we have v minus v naught. Okay. On the other side, where we're integrating over time, oops, uh, let's, let's do a little bit more work to uh, figure that one out. So the first thing to notice is we have v naught. Let's integrate the term v naught. Now v naught is just a constant. So if I take the constant v naught, that integrates to v naught times t. Okay? The second term is a t. Now acceleration is a constant. Okay, so that's just a constant out front, but t integrates to one-half t squared. Okay, so I'm going to have one-half times a times t squared. That's how I integrate the second term. And I take that from zero to t. All right? So here's what we do next. We take r minus r naught. That's the left side. And then the right side, we're going to plug in the limits. Okay, so I'm going to have v naught plug in the top limit is t plus one half a t squared. Again, plugging in the top limit. And then minus what we get when we plug in the bottom limit. So we have v naught times zero plus one half a times zero squared. And of course, that just goes to zero, right? Because we're multiplying by zero everywhere. And that leaves us with the second kinematic equation, which is r is equal to r naught plus v naught t plus one half a t squared, okay? So here, let's put a box around that. And the first one we derived over here, okay? Now, there is a third kinematic equation. I'm not going to go through the derivation of that. You can get the third equation by taking the first two that I showed you and then substituting out time, substituting out t as a variable, and that will give you the third kinematic equation. Okay, so that's where these come from. Okay, so next, let's talk about projectile motion. We've uh, seen the kinematic equations. We've seen where they're derived from.
in terms of calculus. So now let's put them to use. Let's uh, give an example of where we can actually use the kinematic equations. So projectile motion refers to the motion of an object that is thrown into the air or maybe launched into the air in some way. And of course, we're gonna make a couple different assumptions that make the problem a little bit more simple, okay? easier to deal with. So the first assumption that we're gonna make is that the projectile is moving over a small distance compared to the size of the earth. So for example, if I throw a baseball, you know, if I have a good arm, it could travel a couple hundred feet, but that's a very small distance compared to the size of the earth, okay? On the other hand, if I were to say launch a missile halfway around the world, you know, and land in the Pacific Ocean somewhere, um, yeah, then our projectile motion equations don't really work. So we're, we're assuming that uh, distances are small compared to the size of the Earth. Okay, the next thing we'll assume is that the effects of Earth's rotation are negligible. So whenever you launch a projectile, um, that projectile is moving on a rotating Earth. The Earth itself is spinning on its axis. And that has, you know, subtle effects on how things move. We're going to ignore those effects. Okay, the, the, the last point here is that we're going to neglect air resistance. So, of course, when you throw a projectile into the air, uh, it will experience air resistance. But that is a somewhat complicated force to deal with. Okay, so we're going to neglect it and then later on see how we can deal with air resistance. Uh, but for now, we're assuming only gravity is pulling on the object, okay? No air resistance, just gravity pulling the object down as it moves through the air. Okay, so under those assumptions, um, the problem becomes pretty simple. We have projectiles that move in two dimensions with a constant downward acceleration. So we all remember the variable g, lowercase g. It's 9.8 meters per second squared. That is telling you the acceleration due to Earth's gravity. Okay, so whenever we have projectiles moving uh, in Earth's gravity, we use that acceleration g is equal to 9.8 meters per second squared. And we also know that it's downward. Okay, so the, the acceleration vector, as you see in the diagram on the left, is pointing down uh, at all times, okay? So if we think about the acceleration as having an X component, so X is horizontal and Y is vertical, there is no X acceleration, okay? Gravity does not accelerate things in the horizontal direction, right? Gravity only accelerates things in the vertical direction, up and down. So what we say is the X component of acceleration for a projectile is just zero, whereas the y component is minus g. So that minus sign is there to tell you that the acceleration is going down as opposed to up, okay? So with that all said, let's do an example. Let's say you're standing 18 meters away from a building, which is 15 meters tall and has a large flat roof. You throw a baseball with an initial speed of 22.5 meters per second at an angle of 55 degrees above the horizontal. When the baseball leaves your hand, it's 1.5 meters above the ground. The baseball lands on the roof of the building. How long is the baseball in the air? So how, so how much time in seconds passes uh, from when the baseball leaves your hand until it lands on the roof? That's, that's the first question. The second question is, how far in meters onto the roof does the baseball go? And then lastly, what is the speed of the baseball? How fast is it moving uh, just before it hits the roof? So let's work this out. Okay, so let's work this problem out. I've copied down the picture uh, that was on the slide because we're gonna use that for reference here. Um, remember, there's a person throwing a baseball uh, starting from a height of 1.5 meters, and then it lands on the roof, which is 15 meters tall, and 18 meters away from where you're standing. So let's actually put a little bit more detail on this picture. In particular, it's really important that we have coordinate axes, X and Y, 
that we can use to keep track of how the baseball is moving. So the x-axis is keeping track of the horizontal motion of the baseball, and the y-axis uh, keeps track of the vertical motion like this. And let's actually take note of where the origin is. It's down here, um, where the x and the y-axis um, meet each other. Let's also take note of the times involved. Uh, we, we assume the motion starts at t equals zero. That's over here. And then it lands over here. The motion ends at some other time. We don't know what that time is. So let's keep that as an unknown variable. Okay, some other things to note. This point right here is the initial position of the baseball when it starts off at t equals zero. So we actually can write down what that initial position is. We know exactly what the x and y coordinates are at that position. So we'll call that x naught, y naught as an ordered pair like this. So what's the x coordinate when the baseball starts off? Well, it's zero. What's the y coordinate? Well, that's 1.5. That's the height above the ground it starts at. As for the final position, what do we have? Well, we can call that x comma y. So if we don't have the little not subscripts, we're talking about the final position, remember? And we actually don't know um, the final x position, right? We don't know the distance horizontally from where the ball is thrown to where it lands. So that's going to be a question mark, right? I don't know the final x position. But I do know the final y position because if it lands on the roof, its y position has to be 15 meters. Okay? The next thing we should uh, get into is the initial velocity. Okay, so the initial velocity is a vector which tells us how the baseball is moving right when it leaves the person's hand. And we can take that initial velocity vector and break it into x and y components. Okay, so this would be v naught x, and this would be v naught y, the, the x and the y components. And there's some angle here which we'll call uh, theta naught. Okay, now it's time to do a little bit of trigonometry. I hope you all remember the definition of the sine function. The sine of an angle is equal to the opposite side over the hypotenuse on a right triangle just like this. Well, in our case, the opposite side is v naught y, and the hypotenuse is the magnitude of that initial velocity. So if we rearrange that, it says v naught y is equal to the magnitude of v naught times sine of the angle, sine of the launch angle. And that's actually something we can calculate because we know the ball is thrown at 22.5 meters per second. That's the magnitude of the initial velocity. And it's also thrown at an angle of 55 degrees, so sine of 55 degrees, and here's what we get. 18.43 um, meters per second. I'm putting a little bar above the four to indicate that we keep just the three sig figs in this calculation. Uh, okay, let's also remember the cosine function. Cosine of an angle is equal to the adjacent side over the hypotenuse. And on this particular right triangle, the adjacent side is v naught x, and the hypotenuse is the same as before, the magnitude of that velocity. Again, the length of that arrow is the magnitude of the velocity. So what we have is v naught x is magnitude of v naught times the cosine of that angle. And so we'll plug in 22.5 meters per second times the cosine of 55.0 degrees. And what we'll end up with is 12.91 meters per second. 
Okay, so what we just did is we found the x and the y components of the initial velocity. Okay, so that's, that's going to be very useful for us. Okay, so the next thing I'm going to do is write down one of our kinematic equations, which is r is equal to r0 plus v0 times t plus 1 half at squared. Okay, so that's, that's the kinematic equation for position that we derived earlier. I also uh, showed you guys how you can take any kinematic equation and you can break it into an x and a y equation separately. So here's how this goes. For my x equation, I'm going to have x, that's the final position, is equal to x0, that's the initial position, plus v naught x, that's the initial velocity, times t. And then I have 1 half at squared, but I don't have any acceleration in the x direction. Let me remind you that ax is 0, and ay is minus g for projectiles. So there is no x acceleration, so that last term in our x equation is just 0. For our y equation, we have y is equal to y0 plus v0 y times t. And then for acceleration, I'm plugging in minus g. So I have minus 1 half gt squared. Okay, so there you go. Now I can work with either one of these equations. Um, how about I take the y equation and just plug in what I know. Okay, so if we, if we look at the y equation, uh, the final y position is on the left-hand side. Do we know that? Well, yeah, we do. It's 15 meters. Remember, 15 meters is the height of the roof, so that would be the final y position. We wrote that down earlier. Then we have y naught. That's the initial y position. Do we know that? Yes, we do. It's 1.5 meters. That's also given to us. Okay, then we have v naught y, which is 18.43 meters per second, and that multiplies t. And then we have minus 1 half times g. Now, in this case, g is 9.80 9 meters per second squared. That multiplies t squared. So notice that when I write this down with all the, uh, the variables plugged in that we know, the only unknown here is t. So I can use this equation to solve for the time that the ball lands on the roof. Okay? So you should be looking at this and thinking this kind of looks like a quadratic because I have a t squared, I have a t, and then I have a constant term, and that's correct. But let's put this quadratic in the standard form, okay? So, so first, if I have a half times 9.8, that's 4.9. And if I add that to both sides, I'm going to have 4.9 meters per second squared. So now it's positive because I moved it over to the, the left side times t squared. And I'm also going to subtract uh, this term, 18.43 times t. I'm going to subtract that from both sides. So it ends up over here as a negative term, minus 18.43 meters per second times t on, on the left-hand side and then it disappears from the right-hand side. Uh, and then I'm gonna subtract 1.5 meters from both sides. So get rid of it on the right. On the left, I have 15 minus 1.5, so that's gonna be 13.5 meters. And then, since I've subtracted everything from the right side, I just have zero there now. Now that's a quadratic expression uh, expressed in the standard form, where A, is this term multiplying t squared, b is this term multiplying t, and then c is this term, uh, which is constant, okay? So I hope you all remember the quadratic formula. If I want to solve for t, it's going to be minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac divided by 2a. Uh, 
So that plus and minus sign always ensures that we get two possible solutions, okay? And, let, and so basically, you can plug A, B, and C, shown here, into the equation. I'm not going to go through that right now. I'm sure you know how to plug those numbers into a calculator. So let's just skip to the answers, okay? We have 0 0.996 seconds for our first solution. And then we have 2.7646 seconds for our second solution. And technically, you know, we'd keep three sig figs on that. So we have a little bit of a dilemma because which of these two times are we going to pick? We, we can't have two different answers. Well, let me uh, scroll back up to the top, okay? Basically, the question we tried to answer by doing this calculation is, at what time is the height of the baseball going to be 15 meters? Well, actually, it happens twice. Let me draw a little line here. So that's a height of 15 meters uh, with that, that line I just drew. So we reach that height over here when the ball is on the way up. We also reach that height over here when the ball is on the way down, right? And those are the two different times that we calculated. The first time we calculated, the smaller time, of course, is this one back here when it's on the way up. When it's on the way down, that's, that has to be the longer time because that happens later. That's the one we want. Okay, so we're going to pick the longer time and say the ball lands on the roof at time 2.76 seconds. Okay, so we've answered the first question. The second question we want to answer, and I'm going to go back to the drawing, is how far onto the roof does the ball go? So in particular, let me draw that distance. From the edge of the roof to where the ball lands, how far is that onto the roof? Let's call that distance D. Okay. Okay. So if we want to answer the question, um, how far onto the roof does the ball go? We're going to use the X equation. So our X equation says that X is equal to X naught plus V naught X times time. And we can actually calculate this directly because the baseball starts at X equals zero. So that's what I plug in for X naught. And V naught X is something we calculated for the initial velocity in the X direction. That's 12.91 meters per second. And then finally, we have T, the time it takes for the ball to get to the roof, which is 2.7646 um, seconds. And, and the bars over those numbers just means we're going to round to three sig figs when it's time to report the final answer. But if you do this calculation, you get 35.69 um, seconds. Okay, so let's be clear about what this number is. This is the total horizontal distance that the ball travels, okay? That's not what we want. We want the distance onto the roof that it goes. So remember, the roof is uh, 18 meters away from where you're standing when you throw the ball. So if we take 35.69, uh, oop, I should have said meters. Yeah, meters. 35.69 meters, and then we subtract 18 meters, which is how far away the, the building is, then we'll get 17.69 meters, which we'll actually have to round to... Um, 17.7 meters. So, so the ball goes, the ball goes 17.7 meters onto the roof. Okay, there's one last question here, which is how fast is the ball moving when it lands on the roof? So for this, we should be thinking of the velocity equation. We're, we're asked about um, how fast something is moving. You should be thinking velocity is relevant here. So I'll write down the uh, kinematic equation for velocity. This says V is equal to V naught plus AT, 
And just like before, we're going to break this into an x equation and a y equation. My x equation says vx equals v naught x plus, well, what's the acceleration in the x direction again? That's zero. All right, projectiles don't accelerate in the x direction. Here I have vy equals v naught y, and then I have to plug in minus g for the acceleration in the y direction. And there you have it. So again, what is this telling us right here? The velocity in the x direction is constant, right? Doesn't matter what time you plug in, you're always gonna get the same number out. And this makes perfect sense because there is no acceleration in the x direction, okay? So with that said, Vx, the velocity, the final velocity of the projectile when it lands on the roof, it's just the same as the initial velocity because it doesn't change. And that's 12.91 meters per second, okay? Whereas the velocity in the y direction is going to be v naught y minus gt. And we have to plug in the numbers here. So for v naught y, we had 18.43 meters per second, we worked that out earlier. Then I subtract 9.8 meters per second squared, and then I have to plug in the time. Well, the time is uh, 2.7646 seconds. Again, that's the time that the ball lands on the roof. That's what we care about. So if you crunch these numbers, uh, v, Vy, the final velocity of the ball in the y direction, is minus eight 0.663 meters per second. Okay? So that's not quite what we want. We know the x and the y velocity separately, but what we want is the speed. How fast is the ball moving is talking about the speed of the ball. So for this, um, I'm going to draw a little diagram. So the velocity that we're talking about is pointing downwards and to the right like this because it has a positive x component but a negative y component. So the, the y component should be pointing downwards like this. Vx is this part. That's 12.91 meters per second. And then Vy is this part, which is minus 8.663 meters per second. What we care about is the speed, just the magnitude of the velocity. So by the Pythagorean theorem, we can say that the magnitude of the velocity is the square root of Vx squared plus Vy squared. So if we plug in Vx and Vy, we have 12.91 meters per second squared plus negative 8.663 meters per second and square that as well. And if you do the calculation, you're going to get 15.547. But we're going to keep uh, three sig figs on that. So the baseball is moving at 15.5 meters per second just before landing. So those are the answers. Um, so that was kind of a long projectile motion problem, but it does cover a lot of the different aspects. So we'll end today's video right there. Uh, we'll continue on with our review of basic physics uh, in the next video. So until then, be safe and be healthy out there. I'll see you in the next one.